There's probably no movie that embodies the term high concept more than war games. Oh yeah, that's the one about the kid that breaks into the Pentagon and plays a game and almost starts World War III. It was very new to me. I don't think anybody I knew had a computer at that time. There were no cell phones. It was pretty prophetic. People sometimes make mistakes. Yes, they do. On the one hand, the film is aimed at kids, yet you really feel like it's a movie for adults. Give me an update on those subs. I want to know what those bastards are up to. With the beginning of the 1980s, you've got, you know, movie stars becoming presidents and fans becoming assassins. The world was floating off the rails in this way that caused a lot of people to feel alarm. It didn't seem that far-fetched that somebody could make a mistake and the whole world would suddenly blow up. Launch order confirmed. Holy shit. There are Hallmark films. War Games was one of those. I'm not ready to die yet. That was a cry for everyone to live as much as you can because you don't know if you have another day. It's Joshua! He's still playing the game! We have a launch detection. We have a Soviet launch detection. Quite honestly, I think one of the reasons why the movie works is that it did not begin as a high concept idea. It began, as, as, as most good stories do, as a story about two characters. Wait, wait, I came because of Joshua. I saw a documentary on television about Stephen Hawking and the work that he was doing, which promised to finish what Einstein had started in terms of unifying all the knowledge of the cosmos. And I thought that given his condition, ALS, I imagine a point at which he had figured out the answer, but he would be immobilized and couldn't communicate it to anyone. And I thought, what an amazing situation. He really needs a son figure who could understand him and help him communicate. The idea of a supremely gifted kid in an environment that doesn't necessarily have the means to recognize his gifts was interesting to me. And in fact, I started reading about gifted kids. Walter Parks, uh, who I had been roommates with at college, he asked me what I was working on, and I told him about this project. And I had the idea that we would both write it. We had always talked about working on things together. And it seemed like these two impulses, the young genius that does not know his place in the world and the older genius who somehow needs to pass on whatever wisdom he has, seemed to be interesting poles for a story. I think it was called The Genius. And he was 13 years old, and he was attending Cal Berkeley, and he was a fish out of water, but he was brilliant. I said, it's a very good idea, an original idea. I liked them. We proposed to Leonard Goldberg a research period where we would go and find out how could a kid on his own get into the kind of trouble where he'd come to the attention of someone like a Stephen Hawking. And the original idea had nothing to do with nuclear war or even computers. We looked into kind of the farthest reaches of, you know, technology, because we wanted to have a picture of what world he would be entering into in his journey. All of this led us to like a key moment. Shall we play a game? Oh. We came upon a, a man named Peter Schwartz, who's gone on to be, have an extraordinary career as a, as a futurist. And we described our, 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 our story. And Peter thought for a second, he said, well, you've ever heard of computer games? He said, they're quite amazing, and you can really use some controls and cause things to happen on the screen, and you're in control of it. Well, if you look at that, and then if you look at the missile displays that occur at NORAD or at, at Strategic Air Command, you might see the kind of parallel between your two characters. And Larry and I are sitting thinking, hmm. <laughs> I took down some notes and thanked them profusely. Photovision. I have you now. And the other great discovery we made, this was 1979, was home computers, which I had known nothing about. And then we looked into the hacker culture and thought, well, this, this is great. You know, this is how our, our kid could uh, get into the real trouble. You have the absolute right to remain silent. For what? Hey, Hands on the van, please. Can, what did I do? The other big piece of the puzzle was uh, an article written by a friend of mine from Yale uh, named Ron Rosenbaum. And he had written a piece called The Underground World of the Bomb. And it talked about missile commanders with their keys and the whole simulations that they do for war games. Oh, mark. Launch key inserted. Roger. That kind of was the missing piece. Gee, what if he thought he was accessing a video game company, but actually it was the simulation program for our nuclear missiles? Hmm, that's interesting. 
Every now and then, Norad or SAC would invite people from Hollywood to check out what they were doing. This rather large room here is the command center for Norad. The screens you see in front of you connected to our satellites. And I think we talked our way onto one of those pre-existing tours. They flew us there on a C-130 transport, and we had a tour of the Crystal Palace. After the tour, we were walking back to the bus to go with the tour back to the hotel. And General Hardinger, who was the head of uh, NORAD, comes up, puts his arms around our shoulders, and says, fellas, I understand you're writing a movie about me. And we said, well, yes, we're doing some research. And he says, come on, let's have a drink. And I remember Walter said, well, we're supposed to go with the bus. And he goes, god damn it, I have 50,000 men under my command. I think I can get you back to your hotel. Now, come on. So we went and sat and had drinks with him. And he was absolutely all for the point that we were making to keep men in the loop. He said, uh, I sleep well at night knowing that I'm in charge. The other thing that really struck us was just how professional and smart the people running the place were, particularly General Hartinger. And that kind of like can-do energy and competence really was shocking to us and very much provided the background, the foundation of the character of Barry Corbin. In the original script, the Falcon character is dying. And all the way through, we had one picture in our mind about who would play Falcon, and then the original script in which David Lightman finally found his way to the island and finally found his way to kind of the epicenter of this whole mystery, the Great Falcon. And uh, he sees a pier going out from, from the land. He sees a man in a high-tech wheelchair fishing. And uh, David walked up to him. The idea was that you'd see his hand hit a control and the wheelchair would turn and it would reveal John Lennon. And it was just like such an amazing idea to think we could ever have that in a movie. Talk about moments you remember, we were literally working when the, at the time when we heard about the assassination. In creating the character of Joshua, we did research on the history of uh, teaching machines how to play games, which is the beginning of AI, um, artificial intelligence. What he did was great. He, he designed his computer so that it could learn from its own mistakes, so they'd be better the next time they played. There's almost a subgenre that's existed since the 60s of, you know, movies, novels, stories, television shows about technology that goes out of whack. There was a, a wonderful, I think, uh, underappreciated movie called Colossus the Forbin Project, and it very early kind of postulated the idea of machines becoming intelligent. That was essential for us because we wanted to really create a character in, in Joshua. This started off as a character story between the Falcon character and David Lightman. It soon developed where the conduit for these two characters' relationship was this artificially intelligent program, Joshua. What is the primary goal? To win the game. We had started writing the script, but Walter was going, is anyone going to believe this, that the military could think that they're under attack, you know, because some kid is playing a video game? And I turned on, the, at the time, the 6 o'clock CBS News, and Walter Cronkite, his first words were, for three minutes yesterday, the United States believed it was under a full-scale military attack, and it was a simulation tape that had been left in a machine. And I turned off the TV, and I said, come on, let's keep working. The script took about a year which, given the amount of research, wasn't insane. After a year passed, I didn't hear anything. I said to the woman who was running our company, are they aware they don't have to carve it into stone, they can just write it? She said, well, the boys are struggling, but they'll be here soon. About a month later, she walked in and said, I have the script, but I have to tell you, they couldn't make that story work, so they wrote a different script. I said, well, this is crazy. She said, but look, they wrote the script, you may as well read it. And I read War Games, and it was fantastic, it was outstanding. It was a wonderful script. They read it over one weekend, and they called us up Monday and said, you gave us a very nice weekend, thank you. And so I started taking War Games around to studios, and nobody seemed to get it. They didn't understand the technology. They said, is this science fiction? I said, no, no, it's not science fiction. It's probably science fact. The only positive reception I got was at United Artists MGM, and they said, okay, they would do it. So then we went about searching for a director, and uh, I knew Marty Brest from AFI days, 
and I gave him a copy of the script and he really liked it. And the studio was adamant that Marty was, was the director. Marty was the flavor of the month then. He was a very hot young director and, you know, Marty came on board. And uh, we then went about casting the film. I read it and I really loved it, but I just needed to to work and get my foot in the door, so I was also auditioning for and reading things that, you know, were pretty bad, and this one was just really, really good. I auditioned for it for four months. When you saw Allie, you loved her. You didn't know what she was gonna be doing in the movie, but you hoped she succeeded. She had that kind of a face and that kind of a smile and that kind of an attitude. I think she was wonderfully cast because there is, especially in this film, there's a wonderful sense of innocence about her. You want these kids to be getting in a lot of trouble and blameless all at the same time, but inquisitive and think it's a difficult, and I think they were both very well cast. I'm sorry if I got you in trouble today. I just couldn't stop laughing. Oh, that's okay. You were perfect. I was? Yeah. I think I really got the part because of Matthew, because I had to come in and we had to sort of sit together and do a little conversation while they filmed it, and I just felt so at ease with him right away. That's why I think I got it. He's intelligent, but an underachiever, alienated from his parents. A classic case for recruitment by the Soviets. I read from Marty a bunch of times. Then he wanted to do a test, I think, which I couldn't do. My father told me to suggest that they watch dailies from the movie I was shooting, Max Dugan. We went over to 20th Century Fox, and they showed us some film, and we were immediately taken with Matthew. So they used that as kind of my screen test, basically, and then hired me. So I shot Max Dugan Returns, and, and like a week later began uh, War Games. My part was not that big when I got in the original script. Marty changed it during rehearsals, which was great. In, in the original script, Jennifer wasn't in the second half of the movie. She just kind of sent him the money that he needed instead of coming. But we all felt, who's he going to talk to? And so she was written into the rest of the movie, thank God. I think, and I'm not sure because I don't, you know, I never, it was never in Marty's head, you know. <laughs> but I think there's a really dark element to this particular story. And I think Marty was focused on that. And you know, th this movie could have been darker. It could have been that interpretation, and it would have been amazing, you know, also. There was a version of the script that Marty Brest developed that was considerably darker. They had, I'm not sure if it was a dream sequence, but they had World War III breaking out. I don't know, it just wasn't the tone that we were going for. Through the final stages of development, we had some disagreements with Marty. I remember a key moment. We were on the phone, and suddenly we had been arguing about a story point, and Marty and whoever was working with him kind of said, it's OK, why don't you just try it that way? Like, there was no argument. I hung up the phone, and I said to Larry, we're fired. <laughs> if they're not fighting with us, we're fired. And sure enough, about a half hour later, we got the call from our agent saying that we're no longer involved, which was extraordinarily painful, quite honestly. We weren't really involved after that. We had finished our second draft and sent it into the studio. Uh, but nobody on the production uh, had bothered to read it. We started shooting, and Marty is a very talented guy. He kind of keeps to himself. He has his vision of the movie. And the studio was not happy with the film they were seeing. They thought it was rather simple, not very exciting. And I told Marty, I said, look, the studio's not happy. Finally, uh, the studio said, we want him replaced. I was quite taken aback. That doesn't happen very often in the movie business. It had never happened with me before. It was uh, very uh, strange a week or two into shooting. He took Allie and me for a walk and said, I think I'm not going to be your director anymore after this week. He was very calm about it. I was horrified. I think both of us felt like, well, we can't do the movie without you. And he said, yes, you can. Oh, absolutely, you can. You're, you're doing this movie, and it will be a little different, but it's still going to be a great movie. So there's just this feeling of sadness and, oh my gosh, you know, who's going to come in now? Allie and I were very frightened, of course, that we would be replaced. A lot of actors were replaced. Strange thing, this is only happens in Hollywood, is that Marty's next picture was Beverly Hills Cop. We stood over $250 million. End of the second week, I get a phone call, and they said, well, when you come to work, there will be a different director. 
and John Badham showed up. John and Marty couldn't be more different. I had known of John Badham since his days in television, and his work was really outstanding. The studio concurred. We sent John the script. I got a call from, from my agent saying, oh, there's a problem over at uh, UA, and there's a film that they're not happy with and want you to read it, but I don't want you to do it. And I said, you don't want me to do it? He said, oh, no, this is nothing but trouble. And I said, yeah, but what if the script is good? The whole film was just brilliantly prepared. And the detail of the research that Marty had done was just exquisite. And yet he saw the Matthew character as rebelling against his parents and an unpleasant atmosphere. And so he took a kind of darker tone. The way Marty wanted to do it was not accessible in a way. It wasn't as much a popcorn kind of movie, which the movie also works as. So the thing that John brought in when he came in was a lighter kind of quality. Are you sick? Oh, oh, no, no. John Badham called me up and said, uh, I'm looking at a script here that's going to be three hours long, and it looks like everyone's had a hand in it, including Willie the Gate Guard. Do you have a version of the script that you'd like me to see? And I said, yeah, we, our second draft, no one's read. And he said, well, would you send it over to me? And I said, you know, you're just down the hall from Leonard Goldberg. He has a copy. And he said, uh, I'd rather get it from you. So I knew we had a, a very good director on our hands. I went back, and the script that, that Walter Parks and Larry Lasker had written was by far the best. John said to me, I want to bring Walter and Larry back. I want them to work with me on the script. We were brought back into the production, and it was a very, very exciting time, because we hadn't been anywhere near the studio. I would drive blocks out of my way just not to go near it. And people said, well, your movie's getting made. Yeah, but it, it, it kind of felt like saying, well, at least your girlfriend's being loved. You know, it just didn't feel right. We were able to pretty much go back and either restore or work on new things that, that we felt very comfortable with. In the meantime, I'm looking at the film and I couldn't put my finger on what was bothering me about what had been shot. And it suddenly occurred to me, they're not having any fun. The scene that had Matthew bringing Allie up into his bedroom, there's something dark and evil about the way they're treating this. And yet, I think if I could show a girl how I could break into the computer and change her grade, I would be so excited, I would nearly be peeing in my pants. So when I actually did start shooting, that was the first scene that we did. Ooh, oh, oh, little mess. But now Matthew and Allie were convinced that they were going to be fired. And they were tense and stiff, and we're seven, eight, nine, ten takes in, and nothing is happening. And I'm laughing and telling them jokes, anything I can think of just to kind of loosen them up. And somewhere around take 11, 12, 13, they started to have a little more fun with it. How can anybody get a D in home ec? Is that none of your business? Can you erase this, please? No, do I. Because the whole idea was I couldn't just show them a new version of the scene that was the same or slightly better. It had to be 100% better because everybody was gonna be watching it like a hawk. I think it was a tone change and I think it was kind of an, a different interpretation. The kind of way that it was even lit, the scenes became brighter. Another big difference with uh, John was that I remember we did a take and they were like, okay, we'll go again. And he was like, no, we got it. And I remember the crew being like, let's do one for safety. And he said, I don't need it. So he was from a different world. The speed that he worked at, it was fun. This is unreal. You don't care about death because you're already dead. I remember the first time I heard Matthew say these scenes, they didn't sound anything like the way they had been in my ear. He was almost incapable of a line reading that wasn't somehow fresh. And it was so important because, you know, this is such a technologically dense story. Wow, where'd you get this? I was trying to break into ProtoVision. I wanted to see the program for their new games. I uh, was always somebody who could appear smart or nerdy. And I emphasize appear. I thought it was a part that I could play. Like, I didn't feel like it was all that different for me in a way. I had my odd, you know, 
lonely side, which uh, I thought David Lightman had. I remember them trying to teach me to type, which I didn't know how to do. They also, lucky for me, gave me Galaga that I play at the beginning. They put that in my room. So they said, you have to get good at this. And that seemed the most important part of preparing for the movie to me. <laughs> that I did practice, the typing, not so much. Matthew, he was one of the funniest people I had ever met. And even then, he was doing all this like funny musical comedy stuff all the time, you know, because he loved theater and he's, he's like got this great body for dancing around and he was doing all of that, I love that. Games refers to models, simulations, and games which have tactical that must be and strategic them. applications. What does that mean? I was overwhelmed by all that technology. I still have trouble with computers. So I got to be the naive one, and it was fun. David, is this because of what you did with my grade? We were both new and both open to anything and happy to be there. She was very smart. I'm only 17 years old. I'm not ready to die yet. You won't make a simple phone call? And I got to know John Wood very well. We did Lady Hawk together very shortly after that. General, you are listening to a machine. Do the world a favor and don't act like one. He had done so much stage work and not that many movies or big movies, so he was so much more experienced than me, but at the same time, we were both kind of very impressed by the size of this movie. Get the ICBMs in the bullpen warmed up, ready to fly. Get me the president on my horn. There was just one major cast change that uh, John Badham did. He brought in Barry Corbin for the general, and the guy that had been cast as the general became his sidekick. I'm the guy with the stars on his collar, smoking that big cigar. That cigar as big as a walking cane. Might help to beef up security around the Whopper. No, oh, beef up. How about screwed up? You know, John Badham's father was an Air Force general. I guess I reminded him of his father or something. We've got uh, 100,000 Soviet troops massing in East Germany, and we're monitoring their bombers that are on alert. Yes, sir. Oh, that's a load of shit. Uh, no, 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 sir, not you. Barry Corbin, he's the greatest general in the history of cinema. Every time I've ever actually met a general in the United States Army, they're not characters. They're very serious people, and Barry Corbin plays like the dream of what one would be. You know, there, there's an interesting thing. They asked an Air Force general what he thought about my performance. And he said, it's unrealistic. That general is 20 points shy in his IQ and 20 pounds overweight. <laughs> Excuse me, general. We can't ask these men to go back to the president of the United States with a lot of head shrink or horse shit. I think we ought to take the men out of the loop. I was um, afraid of Dabney because, you know, I've seen Dabney in a hundred movies and he knew what he was doing, but he ended up having a really important conversation with me that I will never forget. He gave me this kind of confidence about what he felt like I really could do as an actress. Did I tell you that next week I was going to be on TV? You're kidding. Listen, an aerobics show that's on in the afternoon with some girls from my dance class. A movie star. <laughs> yeah. We also got a gift from my friend and Leonard Goldberg's friend, Tom Mankiewicz. At one point, John said, we need a new scene. After the point where they leave Dr. Falcon, the movie's going to be a roller coaster. It's going to go faster and faster and faster. I need a moment between Matthew and Allie before the express train begins. But John said, the thing is I need the scene tomorrow <laughs> because I know where I have time in the schedule to shoot it and we don't want to upset the studio by telling them we need an extra day, so I'll just shoot it. They asked me if I would come on and help out. It was a wonderful screenplay to start with. The one scene I wrote was between the two main characters sitting by the shore. Oh, Jesus. I really wanted to learn how to swim. I swear to God, I did. And that was a scene that Mank wrote in one day. I think we got Mankiewicz a washer dryer or something. John Badham loves improvisation, so he'd let you like mess around. And Matthew was really good at that. I wasn't so great at that at that point. Why are we at DEF CON 4? Soviets saw our bombers scramble until they went on alert. Dabney's co-worker. There's like some part where she put his gum in her mouth. 
she just did that. That kind of stuff, which for me, I would go now like, well, of course, you know, if you're an inventive person, you come up with this stuff. But at that time, I really didn't know that you were allowed to do anything that they didn't actually tell you. So that movie is great for me that way. Oh, attack! There's a moment in it, which is literally my favorite moment in the movie, completely unscripted, where Allie and Matthew are working on the computer, and he's called by his mom and is asked, We're going to barbecue tonight. You want to invite your little friend? And Allie does this thing of kind of capturing him between her legs. <laughs> And there's just this moment of like <laughs> perfectly captured adolescent sexuality. It's so beautiful, it's so fantastic. Actually, when I trapped him like that, I didn't actually even think that there was anything, any kind of sexual connotation to it. I mean, I didn't. I was just like, there he was and he's moving away and it was like, yeah, stop. Like, brother sister kind of playing and John laughed and he said oh, that's really great you know and I didn't know what that actually looked like until later when I saw the scene and I thought oh my god it's like she's sexually kind of messing with him I remember that I think I was 20 and Allie was probably younger than me so it wasn't like a big reach to be you know awkward teenagers in a in a bedroom <laughs> we've had men in these silos since before any of you were watching howdy doody Barry Corbin improvised some of the funniest lines in this movie. He just came up with them. I'm pretty sure the piss on the spark plug line came out of his. He just like said it suddenly. Well, the background of this story is my cousin one time, I dared him to get up on the fender of the tractor and take a leak on the spark plug while the tractor was running. It knocked him about three rows into the field. You know, that electric, that electric current running up that, that water current is not pleasant. Anyhow, John Badham said to me, think of a colorful way to order him into the computer. I thought of that when we said that, and he said, now do you want to tell me what you're going to say? And I said, no, let's just roll the camera. You know, I said, God damn it, I'd piss on a spark plug if I thought it'd do any good. Let the boy in there, Major. When they caught, everybody was laughing hysterically. It was really, really funny, and I just thought, oh my gosh. I think that the movie has those little delights all the way through, kind of goofy, off-story moments. That, that make the movie more than just the sum of its parts. NORAD in this film becomes another character, like an actor and so forth, in, in, in the picture. That's what's important when you begin to analyze what you're gonna photograph and what you're gonna deal with in telling your story visually. In that research on what NORAD was, how it operated, the only thing we could really find was an article in National Geographic that gave a few glimpses of the room, the screens. And then I designed something that was, you know, a little bit more acceptable as a theater. The sets were built on the largest sound stages on the MGM lot, and the sets went wall to wall inside these stages. That was the main war room. My understanding is it was the same sound stage where they built Munchkin Land and uh, The Wizard of Oz. It was a wonderful set. One of the guys at the studio said, the set has to look bigger on film when you're shooting it. And I said, well, how much bigger can it look? You know, we can hardly get it in the screen now. And they said, no, no, this was the studio's idea. On the far, far wall behind all the screens, let's build catwalks and let's put midgets on the catwalks so it'll appear to be much bigger than it is. So I went to Batham and I said, the studio has this idea, John. <laughs> what do you think? We're gonna build catwalks and put midgets on them so the set will look bigger. He said, you know, I'm really busy now. <laughs> War Games was interesting. It was produced, you know, in the early 80s, and at that time, uh, all visual effects uh, were generated optically and composited optically. And we had the task of creating a war room that had 12 giant screens, unlike any giant screens anybody had ever seen before. And of course, those kinds of screens didn't exist. We decided, okay, we're gonna have 12 projection screens up there. We've got five arc projectors on the five top screens. 
We've got seven smaller screens below, which will all be rear projected. That meant there were these huge film projectors at the back of the stage and at the front of the stage going in both directions. And they all had to be running in sync with each other. There were also 84 video monitors, which all had to be in dead sync. So now everything has to run together and nobody had ever tried anything that complicated before. We had to build a strobe system that was the brightest, most powerful 24 frame per second strobe system on the planet at the time. Every time an explosion would bloom on the screen, the strobe would go in perfect sync with the motion picture camera and with the projector. All of that was controlled from an Apple II. It was an amazing confluence of a lot of emerging technologies. The idea of having a personal computer was very, very rare. If you had one, it was some huge big box that was slower than Christmas and very expensive. I'd never seen one before. I just thought it was, you know, this bizarre idea for the movie, just like everything else was. Greetings. IMSI was one of the first uh, personal computer makers. It was iconic. It was completely configurable by anybody. What are you doing? Dialing into the school's computer. The biggest fight I had with Mike Fink was in trying to sort out what we didn't need to see. He had every single process. So here's Matthew having to type all of this stuff in, and I'm saying, it's way too complicated. I just want him to be able to go bub, 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 and he's logged in. And, oh, no, we can't do that. We have to have all of these elaborate steps. I said, well, if we shoot them, I can promise you we're going to cut them out. It's not really authentic. I said, yeah, but it is boring. All right, smoking or non-smoking? Non-smoking. Non-smoking. When John Badham came, he was smart enough to know that a lot of people wouldn't be able to read the screen. <laughs> Originally, it was thought that if you showed the screen with words on it, people might understand. But uh, research showed them that a lot of people would say, hmm? So uh, they started the computer talking. People sometimes make mistakes. Yes, they do. How can they talk? The interesting thing was uh, when we started to design the, the, the robot voice, I went to John Wood and I said, would you do the voice? And, and he said, yes. And I said, we're going to do it in a peculiar fashion. I want you to read the sentences backwards. If the sentence is, hello, how are you? I want you to say, you are how, hello. Why would I do that, he says. I said, because in the way that I think that voices are being created electronically in computers, it's a lot of single words that are being pulled out of a database real fast. So if you read it backwards, you have to you know, say these words very flatly. Wouldn't you prefer a good game of chess? <laughs> I have to say that it was a good decision to do that because it made it accessible to me. I mean, I could hear these sort of like lines coming out of it. The name of the computer that the Air Force had given it was PSYOP, and PSYOP stood for Single Integrated Operation Plan. It was the most boring acronym I had ever heard of. It didn't say anything, it didn't tell you anything, and a good acronym should at least have something that makes you remember it. So I said, what can we do here? Whopper came to mind as I, I fiddled with PSYOP and War Operation Plan Response, Whopper. It played off the hamburger as well as having a funny image of going whop, 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 like that. I sat inside the machine with an Apple II, John would be outside with a camera, and he'd say, Mike, uh, make it count down from here to there. And I'd type some stuff in it and press go, and it would start counting. So when you're watching the Whopper go crazy at the end of the movie, you have to remember there was this little skinny guy uh, with a very big mustache at that time uh, typing away at an Apple II. It, it was really a lot of fun and tremendous hard work. The post process, we, we were blessed with one of the best editors ever who got an a Editor's Guild ACE award for his editing of War Games, Tom Rolfe. If I had dropped dead on the final day of shooting, Tom's first cut you could have put in the theater was that good. Hold the door! Hold the door! We had one ongoing argument. Hold the goddamn door! There's an enormous bank-like vault 
door that swings slowly closed. <laughs> John went in a prolonged suspense. And my feeling was that if you cheated the audience by slowing the door down, instead of prolonging the suspense, you were dissipating it. And went over to John, ran it for him, and he says, uh, okay, you can have your version in the television version. And so there is a version that played on television that has the, in my opinion, the correct tempo of the door closing, but not in the theatrical version. The big question was uh, what to do with the music. The bulk of the score is based on six notes. Da, 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 da. And it's, it's inanely simple. And I remember, <laughs> I remember when, when I first started talking with John, and he said, well, what is the score going to be like? I went, dun, 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 dun. And God bless him, he said, well, I don't know. I guess it'll be OK. <laughs> <laughs> There is a, a very important synthesizer element in the score, which you hear throughout, and it relates to the character of David. And it's first heard right in the beginning of the film when he is playing the video game. Almost everything in the score is contained in that little video game song called Video Fever. For example, when he's called into the principal's office. So it's, again, it's that synthesizer element that sort of follows David throughout the picture. The funny part had to do with songs. We start showing it to uh, different musicians at the time, and, and they said, yeah, we love this movie. You know, we're gonna go and write a song for it, and they did, they wrote something really terrific. And a funny thing happened at, the, at MGM around that point. They decided to bring in a new president, and at one point, Leonard and I are talking in front of him, and I said, well, and we've got these songs coming in that are gonna be terrific. He goes, songs? Songs never helped a movie ever. I said, well, I did this movie called Saturday Night Fever, that had songs in it. And I seem to remember The Graduate had some pretty good songs. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. So now, all of these songs that we had been working on for weeks all had to go in the dumper. <laughs> so we had to quickly get together an, an additional recording session. And, and I said to John, I don't know, what, what do we want to do? We can't use the song. And he said, well, you know, just, I don't know. And I said, well, how about a harmonica? And everybody I have spoken to for almost 25 years when I say I did war games, they say, the harmonica. And I want to say, well, what about the rest of the score? There's 85 musicians sitting there. <laughs> All right, flush the bombers, get the subs in launch mode. We are at DEFCON 1. DEFCON 1. I remember we screened the movie in a suburb of San Antonio. When the movie ends and the Whopper says, The only winning mood is not to play. The audience stood up and applauded, and that was thrilling. That was thrilling. When it wasn't just an intellectual discussion, it had affected real people. We got great reviews, and, and there was a lot of eager anticipation for the movie. You know, people, the kids knew about it, and the kids were there and lined up, and it was it was quite a big hit. I remember being on a subway and reading a newspaper that said, uh, movies that had legs. I had never heard that expression, and they said, uh, war games appeared to have legs, like it was not going down, which meant people were telling their friends to go see it. You know, you go to the theater to see how you're doing, and the Return of the Jedi was playing, and of course the line was humongous. In fact, it stretched down toward our theater. And I would go to some of the people and say, look, you're gonna be here for at least two shows. Why don't you see our movie, and you can get right back online. Someone will hold your place. It was such a strange, fun time. You know, I, I remember walking in Central Park and somebody saying, hey, you're, you're the guy from War Games. I just saw it. It was the very first time I was recognized from a movie. Many things connected with war games, despite its rocky beginnings, 
was serendipitous. Beyond the critical praise, we got three Oscar nominations. I knew after it came out that, um, you know, I was going on better auditions. I know I wouldn't have gotten Breakfast Club if I hadn't done War Games, because John Hughes saw it, and he wouldn't have had that idea, I don't think, if I hadn't done it. It was transformative, certainly, for me and Larry. We went on right afterwards. You know, we had a, a number of ideas that we put into development, like Awakenings, some we wrote, like Sneakers. and So it, it really created a little group of movies that we were able to make over the 80s, and it was the springboard to what's been a, a, a wonderful run. It was my first uh, lead in a movie, so it did, uh, it did a huge amount. I guess it got me the next job, like Lady Hawk, and um, Ferris Bueller came partly from that. I steal a code in more games to uh, change my grades from home, and then years later in uh, Ferris Bueller, use what I learned from more games to change my grades in Ferris Bueller. What is all that stuff? I don't know. They're trajectory headings for multiple impact re-entry vehicles. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's great. <laughs> These days, it's a commonplace for a movie to have a young protagonist. You know, no matter how global the issue. War Games at the, its time was very novel for that. And I think it succeeds. It succeeds not only with its young audience, but it succeeded with its adult audience because, in effect, David is an archetypal 60s kid. He's rebellious, he's, he's in trouble with the authorities, and his rebellion and his con persistence in rebellion leads to a positive change. Extinction is part of the natural order. Well, shit! If we're extinguished, there's nothing natural about that. It's just stupid. This was the era when Hollywood was really starting to target kids just as a demographic. And the result would be a lot of bad movies. But War Games really felt different in that it was a movie targeted to kids, and you felt it was really about adults. Because it's really using the kid heroes to make a statement about the adult world. It's saying that you almost can't be responsible if you are navigating a war through a computer screen. Gentlemen. I wouldn't trust this overgrown pile of microchips any further than I could throw it. And I don't know if you want to trust the safety of our country to some uh, silicone diode. I arranged for the Reagans to watch war games uh, at Camp David. And because Lou Cannon reported in the Washington Post after that weekend that uh, Reagan came into a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and said, do you fellas realize that a kid could uh, trigger a nuclear war? And he started telling them the plot of the movie, and the Joint Chiefs said, please, Mr. President, we, we haven't seen the movie. Don't tell us all about it. I always felt it was a cult film for, like, my generation. I don't think it changed the world yet, but I have great hopes for the president that grew up on war games. So on the one hand, you have this movie that is really summing up and almost kissing off the Cold War. And at the same time, the movie is saying, hey folks, here's what comes next. This new generation, the hackers, these kids who were really the first children of the baby boomers. It's definitely one of the stronger pictures that I've made. I have a lot of favorite pictures, but that one has to be in the top two or three of, of my personal favorites of my own films. You can tell where people's interests lie and what they come up and talk to me about. And uh, a lot of them talk about war games. How about a nice game of chess? And I think one of the reasons it remains a really good movie is John and Marty made a terrific thriller. Matthew and Allie were terrific. And they opened up a world to the young people of technology that they embraced. I think also set against the paranoia of a nuclear war. All of that came together and made it a seminal film. We call the bombers! Stand down the missiles! Begin countdown. T minus 60. All right, let's do it. Five. Sir, we have a launch four, order. Three. Put your hand on the key, two, sir. One, launch. We have a launch detection. We have a Soviet launch detection. The Muse confirmed the massive attack. That's a warning to malfunction. Confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. Cobra Day, is this an exercise? Negative, this is not an exercise. Shall we?
we play a game? that a high school punk can put a dime in a telephone and break into our system. I think War Games is one of the first real movies to delve into a computer as it really works and to delve into hacker culture. But very few people actually knew what hackers did or how the actual apparatus and machinery they used worked. The movie described a command and control system that didn't really exist at the time but something like it eventually did happen. War Games came out at what was considered the golden age of hacking. The movie War Games reverberated throughout the hacker community with incredible force. Suddenly, everyone wanted to be a hacker. The word hacker, when it first came out, did not have a bad notion to it. A hacker was simply one who knew how to use computer hardware and software and to fix things. It evolved from the college and university days where students would get access to the college computer and hack the program and make it do better things or make it do malicious things. College students do pranks, just their nature. What are you doing? Dialing into the school's computer. The original hackers uh, started up at places like MIT and Caltech in the 50s when uh, nobody was allowed access to these mysterious computers who wasn't one of the white-robed admins that had been blessed by IBM or UNIVAC. And these were the first guys that felt the imperative to get their hands on and explore these computers even though they were not officially supposed to. They were all into this very pureness of things have to add up in some kind of sense the way nature makes things add up. And these became hackers, and it was basically hacking day and night at computers. Eventually, a hacker took on the connotation of someone doing something illegal, getting in where they weren't supposed to get in. And there was a sort of king of the hill phenomenon that wasn't meant to be malicious. It eventually became malicious on the part of a small percentage of hackers. A computer is not designed to be taken over by anyone, so you have to figure out a way to steal passwords or to get through a little hole that the computer didn't know about and runs a program of years when it doesn't know it's running a program, and they find these flaws all over the place. We used to, in, in the early days, distinguish between hackers, who were just people with skills, and crackers who were people who cracked into systems where they weren't authorized. You'll never get in there. Hey, I don't believe that any system is totally secure. The hackers uh, wanted to use your computers without your permission. There was never any of this noble Robin Hood nonsense among the members of the group that I knew. We knew fully well what we were doing. We knew that there were people out there trying to stop us. In spite of that fact, we were driven by the desire to learn more about it, and certainly by the, the little bit of adrenaline rush you get every time you get into a system. There's a lot of things that you'll never forget the first time of. Getting into a computer you aren't supposed to is one of them. Wow. What? We're in. There are two kinds of hackers. They're the ones who go in and they want you to know they got in. And they deface your web page and uh, they make you look stupid. Then there are the kind of hackers who are much more subtle. They go in, they steal information, and then they clean their tracks up on the way out. You'll never know that that happens. You're really into computers, huh? Yeah. War Games was, the, uh, was, was one of the first movies to actually show somebody at home behind their computer dealing with things like modems, what a PC was. Matthew Broderick's character was interacting with it. He was pulling little tricks and it made it look cool in a way that I think hacker culture had never been before. The history of the hacking subculture is filled with examples of young people who
who, unlike Matthew Broderick's character in the movie, were not necessarily under the impression that they were playing a game against a computer, but they were out there experimenting, curious about what other computers and things were out there hanging off this network and how they could interact with them. Jim, how do I get into that system? I want to play those games. Hacking can be traced back to a small eight-year-old boy who happened to be blind and also happened to have the gift of perfect pitch discovered uh, that if he whistled the fourth E above middle C, he could generate a tone that would stop a telephone call dead in its tracks. But that happened to be the tone that the phone company used to have immediate access to the telecommunications network. A short while after that, John Draper befriended this young boy. So we got to talking, and then he was demonstrating that concept of the blue box. And I says, you mean to tell me that if you send these tones over the phone, you can make a free call? And he says, yes, show me how it works. He showed me how it works. He gave me the frequency of the tones. I went home and built the blue box that night. The blue box basically enables a person to access the national dialing network. John Draper also discovered that uh, in the box of Captain Crunch cereal, it was a toy whistle. And the toy whistle also generated a 2600 hertz tone. And this, of course, allowed people to make phone calls for free, because all you had to do is to send the right tones down the line. A lot of other uh, young experts, experimenters, uh, caught on to this. And we had the phenomenon we now know as phone freaking, uh, also known as blue boxing. Well, when I discovered phone freaking, it was like discovering a miracle. I mean, you could put little tones into a telephone and make free calls anywhere over the world. It sounds like a fiction story, you know? It's a great fiction story. And so I designed this little box that we put up to a phone and make calls all over the world. And we would use the blue box to explore how to get through the system. And what, how does the system work? And what and things can you do that you're not supposed to be able to do? Nobody would believe you're able to do. I mean, it was absolutely just pure hacking on my part, just loving to discover flaws in a system. That's where it all got started, and it all got started by young kids, uh, you know, in one case eight, eight, nine years old, in other cases teenagers, experimenting with the telephone system. This computer company is coming out with these amazing new games in a couple of months. And the programs for them are probably still on their computer. So I told my system to search for other computers in Sunnyvale, California. In the movie, Matthew Broderick had to actually scan down to find the phone number that he needed to get access to the computer to download his game that he was after. That is known as war dialing, where he would just have his computer dial number after number after number looking for a modem on the other end. Uh, that is completely accurate in terms of how things eventually developed in the 1980s. Uh, what was not accurate about the movie in 1983 when it came out was that most schools at that time didn't have computers with modems connected to this thing we now know as the internet. There were, of course, private defense department networks before there was an internet, and they used phone lines. Back during those days, I was hacking the ARPANET. ARPA stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency. It was designed and developed back during the Cold War, so the military would tie all these computers together, and now they can have a distributed computing network, and that eventually became the internet. The internet in the early 80s was still an academic and defense tool, but the internet as a structure existed back then, just most people weren't really using it. And if you look in the film, what he's doing most of the time is using a modem over phone lines, which essentially was just using the standard telecommunications infrastructure that existed at the time. As the internet was expanded and other people were allowed in, that meant the internet a was open to criminals, because it was open to everybody. Uh, and B, that it started to take on roles for which it was never intended. Today, every critical service that our societies depend upon are run by computers that are all on public networks. Uh, so if you damage a, um, a system that's operating the telecommunications grid, as an example, that has a ripple effect throughout all of the various critical infrastructures. There were, every once in a while, these large-scale attacks on portions of the internet that stopped places from working. And so Clinton and Gore said, we need to have a review. And they appointed a presidential commission. That commission came back uh, and said, we have a real problem. The system is wide open to attack. And boy, if it's attacked by a hostile power, 
many of the things that we need to do as a country to defend ourselves, to run the government, and to run the economy cannot get done anymore without cyberspace. I am not by any stretch of the imagination sorry that we went down this road. It's improved everybody's life immeasurably. What I am concerned about is our tendency to deploy technologies as fast as we possibly can without giving any thought to the implications of what those technologies might mean. I wouldn't trust this overgrown pile of microchips any further than I could throw it. It's not just a question of is the United States command and control network safe from hacking, as happened in the movie. But what about all the other countries that now have nuclear missiles? What could happen in the future if a hacker got into the Pakistani command and control network and launched a Pakistani missile toward the United States? Do we know for sure that all of their networks are safe from hackers? We broke into the war game subsystem, all right, using a password left by the original program. You would be surprised by the simplicity of some of the attacks that, in many cases, young people have been able to pull off. In fact, just in the last five, six, seven years, we've had incidents where teenagers have dialed into things like the telephone communication systems that support air traffic control at major airports, where their tinkering has taken down the entire telecommunications grid around that airport including flight command and control systems. So it's still a phenomenon today, and it's still a major problem. Oh, hey, you got a bank. Hmm. Got to make a note of that one. Might come in handy someday. When War Games came out in 1983, it raised a lot of important questions that we're still asking about the internet and computers to this very day. To what extent should there be a human check and balance to uh, the powers and capabilities we give to technology? There was so much about the movie that was fictional, that was not possible in 1983, but that was still right around the corner. I was very excited by the movie when it first came out, uh, because one of the things I always worried about uh, when I was in the government during the Cold War was command and control. So the, the whole issue of the electronics behind the nuclear weapons was something that I was very familiar with, and a movie about that and a movie about the future and about computer networks, I found thrilling, you know, I thought very well done. I wouldn't blame war games for a lot of the hacker culture that occurred after it because there was some serious momentum going on uh, right there at about that time anyway, but there were some famous people who really took it as a challenge to break into really, really difficult places, government operations, et cetera, et cetera. They really took it as a point of pride to be able to get around any blockades put in front of them. There are a lot of ethical hackers out that basically say we only want to discover the flaws in the system with our little experimenting game, find every flaw we can, but not hurt anybody. We want to expose those flaws to the world and to the companies, tell the companies, here's your flaw, please fix it. The stuff that we did back then in our learning phase would have you caught and arrested so fast right now that you, know, you wouldn't have a computer anymore, and that would pretty much be the end of that. So it was, a, it was kind of a, a strange little slice of time uh, that I don't think will ever be replicated again. Wouldn't you prefer a good game of chess? States and the Soviet Union came close to a nuclear war in the early 1960s under President Kennedy and Prime Minister Khrushchev over the Soviets putting missiles in Cuba. When the Cuban Missile Crisis took place, I was in high school, and we were following it in the news. The Strategic Air Command dispersed bombers, took them from their Air Force bases, and put them in airports in cities to raise the stakes, because then if the Russians wanted to attack and destroy our bomber fleet, they had to attack and destroy our cities. And when I got to school, 
there was an air raid drill. And it was clear that none of the teachers knew it was a drill. They hadn't been told. You could see the look of fear in their faces. And I thought, if there's going to be a nuclear war, I'm not sure I want to die in my high school. And I calculated in my head how long it would take to get home and how long it would take for the Russian missiles to hit. We knew that by the time the air raid siren went off, we probably only had 20 minutes before a missile would strike. And I calculated that I couldn't make it home in 20 minutes. I wanted to be with my family, but chances are I'd die alone in the subway. So I stayed at the school. And then we realized it was only a drill. The international mood was certainly different than it is now. There were two superpowers, the U.S. and the USSR. There were certainly war games being played by both powers. From the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis up to the early 80s, not all that much had changed in terms of the relationship of the two. We had a massive buildup of nuclear warheads. They had a massive buildup of nuclear warheads. We have a launch detection. We have a Soviet launch detection. But in the early 80s, you had the atmosphere of the Cold War reawakening when it had basically lay in dormant through the 1970s. President Nixon and followed by President Ford with Kissinger had created this policy of detente, that is to say, standing neutral. You know, the hostilities are acknowledged, but they're not life-threatening. But in the case of Ronald Reagan, you had a true believer as president, a guy who believed that communism was evil. And when the elderly Bolsheviks, who were then running the Soviet Union, saw him coming along, they realized that this guy means business. When Reagan came into office, we didn't understand in the United States the fear that that put into the Soviet military and the Soviet leadership. Moscow thought Ronald Reagan was a real cowboy who wanted to go to war. And so Moscow sent secret agents to US Air Force bases throughout Europe and they would sit in cars near the end of the runway beyond the fence. And their job was to radio Moscow if the American nuclear bombers took off to fly toward the Soviet Union. That's how much they thought it was likely that Reagan would launch a preemptive nuclear war in Europe. He started calling the Soviet Union the evil empire, and people were scared. And we had already been through a Cuban Missile Crisis 20 years earlier, and I think that did have a lot to do with it. There was something called the Doomsday Clock, and it was the opinion of the community of nuclear scientists how close we were to Doomsday. And at the time, 1982, 83, we were like right at around four minutes to Doomsday. That's how tense the situation was perceived to have been at the time. It was absolutely on everybody's mind. Reagan wasn't even talking to Russia at the time. It didn't seem that far-fetched that somebody could make a mistake and the whole world would suddenly blow up. I didn't know about NORAD and that there was a huge facility underneath a mountain to keep running things should this happen. I mean, it, you know, it was real. NORAD, which stands for uh, North American Aerospace Defense Command, they do actually have one of their headquarters in Colorado, and its job is to basically watch the skies. And at the time, if the Russians were going to come after us, they were going to come after us with missiles, planes, etc. Through the sky, NORAD was a big operation back then. Confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. One of the things that uh, people need to understand that NORAD is still doing basically its same missions of assessing and protecting North America, both the United States and Canada, against all airspace and missile threats. When uh, you first come here to Cheyenne Mountain, this is the first thing that you're greeted by is the, what we call the North Portal. It's the uh, main entrance that we have to Cheyenne Mountain. The space inside, we have approximately eight acres of space that have been whittled out of the mountain back in 1961 when it was first began by the Utah Mining and Construction Company. Uh, we have about uh, five and a half acres of actual office space in there that we actually use or occupy by our buildings inside. The facility is protected by 2,000 feet of uh, granite, approximately 285 billion metric cubic tons of it. And there's no greater protection and fortress that you'll have anywhere else in the world. 
NORAD came out of being from the old Continental U.S. Command back in the early 50s. General Partridge, who was the first four-star in charge of NORAD, decided that in order to be able to conduct a nuclear war, he needed to be able to have something that was very well protected for his command and control node, which is how Cheyenne Mountain came into being. This bunker was built to be able to survive a near miss of a multi-megaton weapon in this area. Now, Cheyenne Mountain has never been designed to survive a direct nuclear blast, and that's always been common knowledge. When you first uh, come to the end of the uh, tunnel junction here in Cheyenne Mountain, first in your rear bar, there are two blast doors. They're both 25 tons each, and if one fails, you always have one in place. And uh, during the Cold War, you would also have this as an entrapment area, so that way you were never caught unawares by a bolt out of the blue or a surprise nuclear attack by the former Soviet Union. So you would have people enter with one door open, the door would then close behind them, and the second would open up, thereby always guaranteeing that the facility was protected at all times. What you see behind me here are some of the 1,319 springs that support our buildings here at Cheyenne Mountain Complex. They weigh approximately 1,000 pounds, and uh, they're 47 inches in height. Once the weight of the building is put on them, though, they actually compress down to 37 inches in height. And these act to uh, negate the force of a blast here within the vicinity during a nuclear war. These are basically just larger versions of your uh, shock absorbers that you have on your car. It would allow the buildings to snap back into place and still be survivable and keep all the command and control structures operational. Let's go into a launch mode, close up the mountain. I saw War Games back in 1983. Uh, I noticed that in the film that their command center is very spacious. The differences, I think, uh, between uh, the command center and the film and what you see uh, back here behind me is this is a little bit smaller. When you look at the film and you see that vast array of people that look sort of like a NASA setup, uh, you're not going to see that in the main command center. Once the film came out, we invited the military to see it. And they said, we love this movie. What a wonderful science fiction movie. None of this exists. And we said, really? Some of the junior officers at NORAD who saw it said to us, my God, your stuff is so much better than ours. We only have black and white images. You have color. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. These guys control the entire missile defense system of the United States, and we have color, and they have black and white, and we're just making a movie. It was an amazing film because I think it really foreshadowed many of the tools that we use today. The use of computers to talk amongst each other, the use of computers for command centers uh, to use to make decisions. Shall we play a game? Which side do you want? Probably that's where it goes astray from reality, is that the computers don't make the decisions. The reality is, of course, that uh, the way we do business ensures that there's always people in the loop. The decisions are made by real people with lots of experience who have a good understanding of what's happening around them. This new facility will rely upon the vast improvements in network technology that we've seen really even in the last five or six years. There are some concerns that have been raised by some that by moving out of the structure of Cheyenne Mountain that you put our forces, our command and control, the nation at some additional risk. The reality is that the advantages of integrated network technology of providing decision quality information outweigh the threat that is potentially there. One of the reasons we're keeping the mountain, however, is that you can't discount that some force in the future may be able to hold this building at risk from a long-range missile or some other threat. Cheyenne Mountain's not going away after the transformation, which is supposed to be happening in 2007. And uh, basically, it will still be a command and control node, and we will still use it for uh, training purposes and for real world purposes if necessary. So Cheyenne Mountain is going to be around for many years to come.
tale, a game, a puzzle, an exercise in simplicity, some might even say futility. The relevance of tic-tac-toe has been hotly debated for ages. In 1983, Ali Sheedy had this to say about it. It's a boring game. It's always a tie. Perhaps. But then again, tic-tac-toe might be the most important, influential pastime in the history of the human race. This is an unprecedented look at the hidden secrets and complexities of the game you only thought you knew. Today, tic-tac-toe is largely considered a game for children, but it was not always so. The familiar grid has been found on walls in the temples of ancient Egypt and in the medieval cathedrals of England. The game has even been linked to pagan rituals in which the nine square configuration was thought to have magical properties. But if one still needs to be convinced of tic-tac-toe's historical significance, consider this. It is the fundamental basis for numerous other, more respected games of strategy, namely that stuffy trifle known as chess. Around the globe, our ancient pastime has many names. In the UK, it's known as Knots and Crosses. In Portugal, Jogo do Galo. And the French call it Morpion. But the words tic-tac-toe are actually derived from the 16th century title Tit-tat-toe. <laughs> After all, the game is one of retaliation of tit for tat. The universal appeal of tic-tac-toe stems from the fact that anyone, anywhere can play. Opponents need not even speak the same language. <sighs> to enter the awesome arena of tic-tac-toe, a bit of paper and a writing utensil are all that's required. For that matter, a patch of dirt and a working finger will do. When participating in a match, the goal, of course, is to get three in a row before your adversary does the same. For those with the will to win, here's a few tips. One, if you have the first move, try choosing the center square. Your opponent will be forced to take a defensive position from the very start, giving you the advantage. Two, another smart tactic is to play the corners. By securing the corners of the board, your chances of trapping your opponent are significantly increased. Three. When it comes to choosing whether you wish to be X's or O's prior to a match, I suggest O's. The O's are circles and therefore symbolic of perfection and that which is infinite. Ultimately, the impact that tic-tac-toe has had on the modern world cannot be overstated. Even the computers that we rely upon and take for granted in our daily lives were partly informed by this simple pastime. In 1952, the very first known computer game was a version of Tic-Tac-Toe. It allowed human beings and computers to interface and thus pave the way for all that has come since and all that is yet to come. Ironically, should a supercomputer one day seek to cause the destruction of mankind, we may only have Tic-Tac-Toe to blame for it. So let us hope that all supercomputers are as wise as Joshua in the movie War Games. Strange game. The only winning move is not to play.